You know, the words of Moses, the last words of Moses were not about himself. And I think that's fascinating because he was a humble man. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. And you know, Moses was somebody who was humble, even though he had the most to brag about spending time face to face with God. That's very interesting. We'll study that in a minute. Corey, what are you doing? Deuteronomy chapter 33 and the symbol of the Levites. Ryan, what do you have for us today? Today, I'm actually going to be following Moses' lead as he remembers the days of old, the days when God divided the nations. Very good. Janice, what'd you do? Today, I'm going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, and I'm calling it from beginning to end. All right, very good. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide. If you don't have one, we'll send it to you, but get it out and let's look at it and understand what God is saying to us as we open it up today, because God is speaking. Deuteronomy 33, verses one through six. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun, when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. Let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verses one through six. As we continue to read the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 32 to 34, these are the words of Moses. And much of this is interesting. You know, Moses was an amazing man. I mean, he was brought up in the secrecy of Pharaoh's kingdom and kingship under the care of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, he was raised with the best education the world had to offer, yet he let it all pass away. His temper led to the murder of an Egyptian who was brutally taking advantage of a Hebrew slave. Running away was the only option after his bloody hands were exposed. But for 40 years, he lived among the Midianites, and he even married a Midianite priest's daughter. And it was here, as a shepherd, when Moses saw the fire unique to God. You see, it was a fire, but it didn't destroy. This flame captured his curiosity and sparked a multitude of journeys for Moses. It led him to discover the God of his ancestors, to lead his people out of slavery into freedom, and to write the first five books of the Bible, or the Torah in Hebrew, or the Pentateuch in Greek. Now, at the age of 120 years, at the end of those journeys, his hands are changed to Joshua's hands, and he gives Joshua a final blessing to Israel. And passing away in the wilderness, Moses is buried by God. God himself is the one who does this. In fact, we know that Moses' body was argued over. Satan argued over that. And uh, that happened, and we learned that from the book of Jude. And uh, it is really, really something. If you don't have a Bible guide, then you can write for yours using the address at the bottom of the screen. You can also call us. That's another good way to get a hold of your Bible guide. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's also where we have... The daily programs are there every day, and we have a 24-7 streaming service. It's been there since 1996, a long time. And we stream programs about the Bible and programs about things going on without commercials. There's no commercials. or just information for you. And so you can watch that at any time of day, day or night, 
and uh, we'll bring it to you. It's called Family and Friends Bible Discovery. But if you click on the page that has the cover of the Bible Guide on it, what it will do is it'll take you to uh, the Bible Guide donate page. And if you make a donation to us, thank you so much for doing that. You know, February uh, is a hard month for us. That's a difficult time for us. And so I, I, I'll report over the, in the next couple of weeks how we did in February. But, uh, you know, thank you so much in the last year for your faithfulness and your support of this ministry. I didn't think we would make it, but thank you so much for doing that. It's really important. I won't tell you how much because the Holy Spirit will. I trust the Holy Spirit, of course. I trust him with my life. It's the Spirit of God. And so, if you make a donation, that'll be great. Take you to a PDF file where you can get a hold of the Bible guide. When you do, turn to today's lesson. Now, Moses' final blessing. This is interesting. This, the hands are going to change, as I said, that Moses will give it to Joshua and Joshua will take it over. Moses cannot go into the promised land. Okay? Now, this is interesting. Deuteronomy 33, 1 to 6. Father, I pray today as we listen to this, that you would help us to understand, help us to know. And I feel, Lord, that there may be people today who are watching, who maybe haven't seen us before. And Father, I thank you for bringing us to them. Help us as we give your word, the Bible, the word of God to these people, that they may read it themselves and hear you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, Amen. Make it so. All right. Now let's look at this because this gets interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1. It says, now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Look at that. That was amazing. The last words of Moses were not about himself, but they were about the people of God. If we follow the Lord, the first thing we will see in our death is Jesus Christ. Beloved, remember, when we follow God, God helps us to understand that our life is not always about us. In fact, it's never about us. Our life is about how we can serve others. That's what our life is like. You say, I don't like to do that. I want to serve myself. Well, of course, everybody wants to serve themselves. But when you come to Jesus Christ and give yourself to him and you begin to serve others, things change for you. Let me tell you something, things change. Let's go on. This is interesting, 32, two to five. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000 of saints. That's amazing. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hands. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage for our heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jezron when the leaders of the people were gathered all the tribes of Israel together. What does this mean? The law of God was for spiritual and physical purposes. The law of God was for spiritual and physical purposes. We know that the Lord is fully spiritual, but also fully physical through Jesus Christ, beloved. Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. And we know that he was physical as well as spiritual, something that we need to keep in mind. Now then, we go back to the scripture. This is one verse, 33, verse six. This is really important. Listen carefully. It says, let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few. Now, I need you to see that because Reuben was a man who was cursed. See, the man whom Jacob had cursed because of his inappropriate behavior. Jacob had said to him, you're not going to make it. Moses now blesses to live. You see, God knows we are sinners and forgives those who ask. God knows we are sinners and he forgives those who ask. Do you know the Lord? 
Have you done too much? So you think. You haven't done too much. You can come to Jesus Christ right now. And you can say, Lord Jesus, follow me. Say my words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I need you today. Forgive me of my sin. I need you today. Help me now. In Jesus' wonderful name, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. And I need you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Three times I said, I need you today. If you need Jesus Christ and you prayed that prayer, God has come into your life and made something new. You're a new life. And now all of a sudden, everything you did, everything you were has changed. Follow the Lord now. Follow him and he will lead you right to where you need to be. Today, you and I are going to be taking a look at the Urim and Thummim. Now, these have become, by our reading today in Deuteronomy chapter 33, we see that these have become virtual symbols for the tribe of Levi in general, for this Levitical priesthood. First, let's look at the Urim and Thummim as ancient artifacts and biblical artifacts, and then we'll talk about some of the significance afterwards. The Urim and Thummim of the Bible are a bit of a mystery. They were held by the nine inch square fabric breast piece of the high priest's garb that was decorated by 12 stones, each carved with the name of an Israelite tribe. Despite extensive descriptions of the high priest's outfit, as well as the 12 stones, the Bible is surprisingly silent on the Urim and Thummim. What they were made of, how many of them there were, and their exact function are areas of debate. The only crystal clear thing about them was their purpose. They were to be used for making decisions for the Israelite nation. This decision making was to be done in the presence of the Lord by the high priest at the request of the leader of Israel. How this process worked has been a matter of discussion. The Jewish Roman historian Josephus links the breast piece with a special manifestation of God's presence that involved the glowing of the stones on the breast piece and on the shoulders of the high priest. This association may stem from the possible meaning of Urim and Thummim as light and perfection. Other Jewish traditions envision messages from God being spelled out by a miraculous light, or a vision that saw the carved letters standing out from the names carved on the stones of the breastpiece. While these traditions are interesting, especially in the light of the potential meaning of Urim and Thummim, it's wise to examine the biblical passages that allude to their use. In 1 Samuel 14, King Saul inquires of God by the Urim and Thummim. When God doesn't respond, Saul gathers the nation for prayer and then sets designations for the Urim and Thummim. Urim will mean Saul, Thummim will mean Jonathan. Then the scriptures say they cast the lot between them. This term may explain the small number of mentions of the Urim and Thummim in the Bible. The phrases inquiring of the Lord and casting lots may refer to the use of Urim and Thummim depending on context. Casting lots was also a pagan form of divination and as such was actually outlawed by the Mosaic law. So how do we reconcile the apparent discrepancy between God outlawing divination while also sanctioning a certain kind of it? First, it's helpful to note that the Urim and Thummim were only to be used in the presence of God by the high priest and the leader of the nation. It was their way of deferring ultimate leadership to God's will. Anything apart from this was considered apostate. Second, the prophet Samuel's chastisement of Saul may be helpful here. He says that rebellion is like the sin of divination. How? Rebellion rejects the current authority and seeks to do things its own way, as divination rejects the proper methods of communicating with the spiritual world and seeks to do that its own way. So when it came to divination, was Israel willing to follow God? Or would they make excuses to justify becoming like the cultures around them? 
I think one of the interesting things about this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 33, in which Moses delivers a blessing to the tribe of Levi because of the Levitical, Levitical priesthood, he mentions here the Urim and Thummim that have become this symbol for their tribe, this symbol of their authority, you know, this this uh, place that they had been given to intercede on behalf of the people to God. But it's really interesting when you contrast this blessing of Moses to Levi back to Jacob's blessing of Levi in Genesis chapter 49, which was a very negative blessing, talking all about uh, Levi's impulsive violence, referring back to Genesis chapter 34 and his murder along with his brother, you know, their organization of the murder of the men of Shechem. So we see here this transition uh, that, that the tribe of Levi has been able to pull off because of God's testing of them and their faithfulness to God over time throughout this period of the wilderness wandering. So we see this really interesting story of redemption from I'm Genesis 49, all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 33. You know, it's interesting, Corey, because I I don't screen your pieces before they go to air. Uh, and I, I give you free will to do whatever you want to do. But that's exactly what I talked about as well in the teaching segment. And all of that is the negative that, that Joseph had and then what Moses did. I mean, that that is absolutely stunning. Very good, Corey. Excellent. Okay, Ryan, you're up. What's going on? Well, you know, today we're wrapping up the incredible book of Deuteronomy, which has actually been compared by some scholars to the New Testament books of Romans and the Gospel of John. It's a very, very important book. And in Moses' final song in chapter 32, he reminds the people about the days of old. And I love what he says in verses 7 and 9. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, this passage, it's really significant for a lot of reasons, but today I just want to focus on one of those reasons, and that is that it affirms the historicity of the account of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And this was a time when mankind attempted to unify themselves in a one-world government against God Almighty. But this rebellion would be short-lived because, as Moses reminds his listeners and readers, God scattered them abroad. It truly is a really fascinating story. But what's interesting and important to note is that there's even evidence for the Tower of Babel outside the Bible. Check it out. Genesis chapter 11 records how the disobedient post-flood peoples attempted to unify themselves and to make a name for themselves by building a city and erecting a tower whose top is in the heavens. Though God intervened by confusing their language and scattering them abroad, many of the new people groups would no doubt rebuild. And indeed, there is much evidence worldwide that this was so. Located all across the earth, for example, are many pyramids, ziggurats, monuments, and mounds, as well as other megalithic structures with striking architectural similarities, strongly suggesting that they came from a common source. Many researchers identify this common source as Babel. In fact, Joseph Campbell, in his book Masks of God, claims that there is archaeological evidence supporting a direct link between the ziggurats of Mesopotamia, the same land where Babel took place, and the pyramids of Egypt. Campbell then goes on to show how people spread from these Middle Eastern places and took their culture east, eventually to the Americas. Indeed, several ziggurats exist in Mesopotamia, ranging from relatively simple structures used only as a raised platform for a temple such as the White Temple of Uruk, to massive and mathematically complex such as Edamanaki of ancient Babylon. Some of the best preserved ziggurats include Chaga Zenbil, Siak, and the ziggurat of Ur. In fact, King Nebuchadnezzar is said to have styled the Borsippa ziggurat after the Tower of Babel itself. Indeed, the Babel Tower was probably in the form of a ziggurat rather than a circular tower, as is sometimes portrayed in art. Ziggurats were usually constructed with seven levels, and are believed to have been built as a connection between heaven and earth, as well as the underworld. Similar to ziggurats are pyramids. Far from being restricted to Egyptian borders, 
pyramids are found in far and exotic places all over the world, such as Greece, Italy, China, Mexico, Sudan, and Spain. In Mexico, for example, there are several pyramids, but three in particular seem very reminiscent of the Giza Plateau in Egypt. Indeed, just as at Giza, three principal pyramids have been built at Teotihuacan, namely the Pyramid or Temple of Quetzalcoatl, the Pyramid of the Sun, and the Pyramid of the Moon. Also reminiscent of the Giza Plateau are three pyramid-shaped hills near Milan in Italy, which has actually come to be known as the Italian Giza. Also, in China, a series of 16 pyramids has been confirmed, though some archaeologists believe there could be as many as 100, with the legendary White Pyramid rumored to be 1,000 feet tall. And on the African island of Mauritius, there have been seven pyramids identified. These are paralleled with pyramids found on the island Tenerife, on the opposite side of the continent. These temples and towers are just a small sampling of the many in existence all over the world. The incredible architectural similarities between them clearly links them back to the Babel event. You know, to many secular researchers, these temples and towers are a complete mystery. And not only because they're very similar all over the world, but also because a lot of them are very highly crafted. They're not the workings of primitive peoples as those committed to evolution would expect. That's why artifacts like these have been labeled out of place artifacts. Of course, if you simply accept early biblical history, and in fact, all of biblical history, everything is very much in place. Uh, for instance, the Bible teaches explicitly that man was created on the sixth day of history as fully human and fully intelligent. That explains how early man could have constructed such ingenious structures. And the Bible records that the Babel event, which clearly explains why there would be various towers and temples all over the globe. The Bible is real history, and the sooner that we accept that fact, the sooner the world around us will come into focus. Yeah, very good, Ryan. That is excellent. Uh, and by the way, on the next program, we're going to talk about Rahab. Uh, in Joshua chapter 2, this is that Rahab was the prostitute who lied. God helped her. Very interesting. Janice? Well, today we're taking a look at the end of Moses' life. And of course, he gives his final blessings in Deuteronomy chapter 33. And then in 34, we see and witness his death. But I'm struck by the character of Moses at the end of his life compared to when he was first called and met with God at that burning bush. And so I want to just take a few minutes to take us back to that time in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses has become a shepherd with the Midianites, he has left Egypt, and now he sees a burning bush that isn't being consumed. It's burning, but it's not burning. And he goes and meets God there. And of course, we know uh, if we've been reading through the Bible that God calls Moses to free his people Israel from the Pharaoh of Egypt. And we go through the excuses really that Moses gives. So his first encounter at the burning bush, the first thing we learn about Moses here is Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse six of Exodus three says, Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? These are some of the things that he's asking God. Well, what if they won't believe me and will not obey me? That's verse uh, Exodus four, verse one. And then, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent either in the past or recently or since you've been speaking to your servant because I'm slow and hesitant in speech. That's verse 10 in Exodus 4. He's pulling out all the stops. He's trying to make excuses so that he doesn't have to do what God is asking him to do. And at the very end, please, Lord, send someone else. That's by Exodus 4, verse 13. But now... Let's forward in time as we've read through all of these books and we see what's been going on between Moses and his God. We end his life and the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, starting at verse 10, no prophet has arisen again in all Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. 
Hey, do you remember when he hid his face from God at the beginning? He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his officials, and to all his land. Remember when Moses was said, what if they don't believe me? What if they won't obey me? And for all the mighty acts of power and terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. This is so amazing, Rod, when we, when we see the difference between Moses when he was first called, when he really first encountered God, and then at the end of his life. And so like we today, when we come to know who God is in our life and we come to him and we give him our lives to follow him, we might at the beginning give him all the excuses of the things that we can't do. And you know what? We're right, we can't. But God was with Moses and God will be with you and God will be with me as we fulfill the things that he has called us to do. One of the major things he has called us to do is to give our testimony, to tell our testimony, the gospel of Jesus Christ to our family, to our friends, to all of those around us. Let's move forward in the strength of God in our lives. Today we pray for the persecuted church and we focus on India. If you're watching from India, let me tell you that we love you and we're praying for you. And together we make up the body of Christ. So Father, I pray for our Indian friends, the third largest church in the world, 67 million people. I pray for them that they would know you and that they would understand you. Make them strong, Lord. Help them to stand strong in all of the mess and I pray in Jesus' name that you would be with them today. Amen. 